In this video, we'll examine all the candidates that could be identified with Darius the Mede. Reminder to hit the subscribe button below and turn on the notification bell to stay up to date as new videos come out. And if you're interested in supporting this ministry, just go to JustScripture.org and click on the support page. The main objection that critics raise to the book of Daniel is a figure known as Darius the Mede. To them, this is their ultimate failsafe to undermine the accuracy and inspiration that Christians try to present. The simple declaration by critics is that there are no governmental records bearing this name outside of Daniel. And not to call this another simple argument from silence, because they can point to many records that say that Cyrus was the sole ruler of the empire after the fall of Babylon. So within the Christian community, there have been multiple proposals to try to attach Daniel's Darius the Mede to someone within those accounts that seems that fits the bill. What's interesting is that Darius is the most detailed character found in the book of Daniel. The first descriptions come at the end of chapter 5 that says, And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So first, he is called a Mede. Second, he is listed at 62 years old. And since Babylon fell in 539 BC, this would mean that Darius the Mede was born approximately in 601 BC. The next demographic comes from 9.1 that says, in the first year Darius the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So the third point is that we learn that Darius is the son of Ahasuerus, the Mede. So his father is described as a Mede and not a Persian. Fourth, he was made king or given kingship over the realm of the Chaldeans. So for right now, we should understand the realm of the Chaldeans as the whole territory of the former Babylonian Empire and not just the city of Babylon. Another important feature is found at the end of Daniel 6 that says that Daniel is described as prospering in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus. So the fifth understanding is that Darius ruled alongside Cyrus and that they are two distinct people. Outside of these details, the significance that Darius plays in the book of Daniel is that we see him associated with the fall of Babylon in chapter 5, He's also the lead character in chapter 6, or the second lead character in chapter 6, and his rule is attached to the 70 weeks prophecy in chapter 9, and also the prophecies in chapters 11 through 12 with Xerxes, Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, and the end times. So Darius has, or Daniel, has put a lot of stock in the character of Darius the Mede in that he is a real historical figure. Outside of these five details, we also know that Darius is the one who sets up the 120 satraps and the three presidents to govern the new empire. So no matter who is proposed, that individual cannot be described as someone who wasn't a Mede, or someone who is really young, or whose father wasn't a Mede as well. So items one through three will be the first set of criterion that an individual must pass. Items four through seven will be the second set of criterion that an individual will need support from extra biblical records to be possibly identified with Darius. The three main proposals within the Christian community first come from J.C. Wickham that says that Gubaro should be equated with Darius the Mede. The second proposal comes from D.J. Wiseman who says that Cyrus and Darius are actually the same individual. So this would mean that the author was simply interchanging the names as he wrote throughout the book. And the third main proposal comes from William Shea who says that Ugbaro, Gubaro, and Gabrias are the same individual to be equated with Darius. These authors aren't the originators of these proposals but simply who they are most associated with in the modern academic world. Now, if you're wondering who are these people, you know, other than Cyrus and where do they come from? Well, Gobrius is spoken of in Xenophobe Cyropedia 82 times as he is the lead general on the night of the fall. Gubaro is described one time on the Nabonidus Chronicle where he is appointed governor of Babylon and then he appoints sub-governors after his promotion. Ugbaro is described two times on the Nabonidus Chronicle and that he was governor of Gutium and described as the lead general for Cyrus on the night of the fall of Babylon. So at this point, scholars get to look at the whole picture here and try to make some connections. The most obvious one is that they could see Gobrias and Ugbaro are both the lead general for Cyrus. Then you could see that Gabaro and Ugbaro are both governors and since they are both on the Nabonidus Chronicle and so similar in spelling, that they could be seen as the same individual. So you can see how you could possibly merge all three of these people together and see the resemblance to Darius the Mede, especially 
the detail about Goodbarrow appointing sub-governors. And that is why Shea saw that these three were speaking of the same individual, but for Whitcomb, he only connected Goodbarrow to Darius the Mede. With that background, we can now put these views and the characters within them to the test, starting with Ugbaru. He gets a pass on items 1 through 3 simply because there is nothing in the Nabonidus Chronicle that contradicts this. So the possibility that he was a 62-year-old Mede and son of Ahasuerus the Mede is an open possibility. Then items 4 through 7 seem to connect fine without any contradictions as well. But there's a really troubling detail with Ugbaru that proponents likely won't mention. The last reference to Ugbaru on the Nabonidus Chronicle says that he died one week after Cyrus entered Babylon. So if Ugbaru was promoted to governor or king, then his one week rule would go something like this. On day one, he would have needed to be made king, set up the 120 princes, and the three presidents throughout the whole empire. Then on days two through four, he would need to encompass all the events of chapter six from the plotting to kill Daniel, get the decree out, Daniel violating it, the conspirators informing him, Daniel camping out overnight in the lion's den, and then still alive the next morning. Then on day five, Daniel would receive the 70 weeks prophecy after three weeks of fasting, which means that this started prior to the fall, which really doesn't make any sense, you know, textually. Then on day six, Daniel would receive more prophecies that includes the statement at the beginning that Michael the Archangel stood in opposition to Satan to confirm and strengthen Darius the Mede, i.e. Agbaru, in his reign. Then on day seven, he finally does die. So, so much for that strengthening that Michael provided him the day before. So you can see why any proposal, including Shay's, that includes Agbaro is rejected because there is no way for all those events to happen in just one week's time. Now you might wonder, well then why would Shay even include him in part of his proposal? Well, he argued that the line referring to his death could be interpreted as a year and three weeks after the fall of Babylon, and not just simply one week after Cyrus had entered in. He eventually stopped advocating for that interpretation, and that is why Whitcomb didn't include Agbaro in his list. So let's now examine Xenophon's Gabrias as a candidate. His ability to pass the first test fails because Xenophon says, while they were concerned with these matters, an old Assyrian prince, Gobrius by name, and when the old man came before Cyrus, he addressed him at once saying, my lord, I am an Assyrian by birth. So he does have the old part going for him, but he clearly says that he is an Assyrian and not a Mede by birth. What is described next is that Gobrius defected away from the Babylonian rule and helped Cyrus march on the walls of Babylon, which is why he knew the way to the king's palace to slay him as we read in our chapter five study. But from this, we see that Gobrius fails the first test and cannot be equated with Darius the Mede. So Gobrius being crossed off also eliminates the possibility of him being equated with Gubaro, but this does leave Gubaro as a distinct and independent possibility. He gets a pass on items one through three because of no contradicting information from the one mentioning of him on the Chronicle. Then items four through seven look really nice because of his appointment by Cyrus and him appointing governing officials throughout the empire. But what are the challenges to this view? The main one is on the available cuneiform tablets that say that Gubaro is listed as the governor of Babylon starting in the fourth year of Cyrus till the fifth year of Cambyses. Then the Behistun inscription has Darius I stating that Gubaro helped him overthrow Smyrna in 522 BC. So you have a gap when somebody else is governing or being the governor of Babylon until the fourth year of Cyrus and this would be pushing Gabaro to about 80 years old at the time when he helped Darius overthrow Smyrna. The way to resolve this, though, is to say that the Chronicles Gubaro is a different person from those other Gubaros that are mentioned. So the Chronicles Gubaro is fine as long as he's not associated with those other Gubaros on those other inscriptions. And also he needs to be separated from Ugbaro and Gabrius as well. So I hope, are you starting to see what the proponents are basically doing with these positions as they go along? When something competes with their view, 
They just say that's a, you know, that's a different person and that coincidentally has the same name and the same position under Cyrus. So as long as a person can present a scenario where their window is just left a little bit open, they can make a proposal that could possibly work. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! Now let me show you how to resurrect the first view. We can't say that with 100% certainty that Gobrius was an Assyrian because Xenophon has been shown to be wrong on so many other occasions. Now you think, am I just making that stuff up? Because Shea actually said, although the cuneiform sources are silent also about Gabaro's ethnic origin, Xenophon refers to the general Gabrius who conquered Babylon for Cyrus as an Assyrian, by which he usually meant Babylonian. If this designation is accurate, it would indicate that Gubaro was not a Mede, but there are so many historical inaccuracies in Xenophon's account of these events that this designation need not be taken seriously. So the Gabrius Gubaro combo is back alive, and just for the sake of it, let's bring Ugbaro back from the dead as well. Now, if you're shaking your head at this in and out process, I get it. Because reading on all the different articles on this topic, you start to get the feel that the advocates of these positions are really grasping at straws. But what these views always do is downplay a very important aspect to Darius the Mede found in Daniel. Darius is clearly described as a powerful king in the empire. He reorganizes the empire's governance with 120 satraps and three presidents throughout the land, and he makes a sweeping decree that prevents anyone from worshiping their own god for 30 days. So, connecting Darius to somebody who's nothing more than the local mayor of Babylon is really not staying consistent with Daniel's descriptions. And the other thing that most proposals state is that Darius is just a throne name, not to be confused with their actual first name. And an example of this would be when people, you know, the emperors took up, you know, name of Caesar or Herod's or the popes, you know, in modern day. They always go by a different name. The problem with that for Gabaro is that he never went by Darius when he was the governor of Babylon because all of the records bear his actual name. Because of those issues, DJ Wiseman rejected the popular views and proposed that Cyrus the Great and Darius the Mede are one and the same person. The clear advantage to this position is that there would be nothing preventing Cyrus from performing any of the acts that are described in the book of Daniel. Now, you might be already seeing some problems with this view, but let's see how DJ tried to sort those out. First, with Daniel 6.28, that appears to make it sound like Daniel went through two different reigns by the word and, Wiseman said that instead of being translated and, it could be translated as even. The scriptural backing to this is 1 Chronicles 5.26 that reads, And the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Syria, and the spirit of Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. Archaeology has revealed that Pul and Tiglath-Pileser are the same person and used both names. So Wiseman advocates that Daniel was using the same mechanism here. And an important distinction, though, to point out is that in 1 Chronicles, both Pul and Tiglath are called the king of Assyria, whereas Daniel, or Darius, is called the king of the Medes, and Cyrus is called the king of Persia. Next, Wiseman has to account that Cyrus would need to be considered also a Mede and not just a Persian. This is possible since Median princess Mandane married Cambyses I, who together had Cyrus. So, Cyrus can be called both a Mede and Persian. An objector to this, though, would say, yeah, but this says that Cambyses was Cyrus's father, not Ahasuerus, as in Daniel 1. Wiseman would counter saying that since Ahasuerus means Xerxes, and this is confirmed as a throne name, that Cambyses could have been referred to as this, but that we simply don't have any record to confirm it at this time. This is how Wiseman concludes his article, so now let's check out where the problems of this Cyrus view go. First, Wiseman didn't give you the whole description from Daniel 9.1. He didn't account for that last part that says that Ahasuerus needs to be a Mede. And there is no turning Cambyses into a Mede. He is straight Persian. The next actually takes us back to 6.28 because the internal complement to this verse is 8.20 that says, the ram that thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. This verse clearly says kings, plural, 
and the two horns represent two kings. The last textual issue the Cyrus view has is the haphazard use of the name Darius and Cyrus throughout the book. Chapter 1 says Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus. But chapter 9 said in the first year of Darius was when the 70 weeks prophecy came to Daniel. If Cyrus and Darius are the same, then Daniel is describing the same year with two different names. But after this, in chapter 10, Daniel goes back to using Cyrus describing the third year. Then in chapter 11, he goes back to using Darius in reference to the first year. And to throw in the other key verses, you have Daniel bouncing back and forth without any rhyme or reason for it. And to add against this equating of Darius with Cyrus, Daniel could have included an equating statement like he did for himself six times in the book that includes the last time in 10.1 where he even mentioned Cyrus but didn't mention his other name as Darius. Personally, I think all three of these views have some serious biblical and extra biblical problems in trying to equate them with Darius the Mede. So where do we go from here? Because if this is the best that Christian scholars have to offer us, then what are us lay folk to do? Personally, I say we go back to the person that was used for 2,500 years. Because what these articles might scarcely inform you is that there is a really good and viable candidate out there and has been simply dismissed over preferential treatment of one historian over another. And that mystery player is Cyaxares II, the Mede. Who? Exactly. Sounds like an Oakland A already. Cyaxares the Mede was always seen as Darius the Mede up until the late 19th century. But this view dropped out of use from academic circles for reasons that we will discuss. But before that, let's look at the history of this view and what evidence supports him as a candidate. St. Jerome commented, as far as the fact that while Cyrus, king of the Persians, was the victor and Darius was only king of the Medes, it was Darius who was recorded to have succeeded to the throne of Babylon. This was an arrangement occasioned by factors of age, family relationship, and the territory ruled over. By this, I mean that Darius was 62 years old and that, according to what we read, the kingdom of the Medes was more sizable than that of the Persians, and being Cyrus's uncle, he naturally had a prior claim and ought to have been accounted as successor to the rule of Babylon. This is the Darius in whom cooperation with Cyrus conquered the Chaldeans and the Babylonians. The key here is that Jerome states that Darius was Cyrus's uncle. But on Cyrus's family tree, we don't see any median uncle. But if you use Xenophon's Cyropedia account, Cyaxares II appears onto the tree who would be of royal median blood. And after the fall of Babylon, Xenophon said, And now when the march had brought them into Media, Cyrus turned aside to visit Cyaxares. After that he met and embraced, Cyrus began by telling Cyaxares that a palace in Babylon and an estate had been set aside for him so that he might have a residence of his own whenever he came there, and he offered him other gifts most rich and beautiful. This sounds very familiar to Daniel 531 about Darius receiving the kingdom and 9-1 that he was made king. This is why Josephus said, And when he was dead, it came to Belshazzar, who by the Babylonians was called Nabalandalus, against him did Cyrus, the king of Persia, and Darius the king of Media make war. Now after a little while, both himself and the city were taken by Cyrus the king of Persia, who fought against him, for it was Balthazar under whom Babylon was taken when he had reigned 17 years. And this is the end of the posterity of King Nebuchadnezzar, as history informs us. But when Babylon was taken by Darius, and when he, with his kinsman Cyrus, had put an end to the dominion of the Babylonians, he was 62 years old. And Darius was the son of Aestyages, and had another name among the Greeks. Moreover, he took Daniel the prophet, and carried him with him into Media, and honored him very greatly, and kept him with him, for he was one of the three presidents whom he set over his 360 provinces, for into so many did Darius part them. So Josephus matches Darius with Xenophon Cyaxares, that St. Jerome was likely drawing upon for both his commentary. And this view carried all the way into the 19th century that even was mentioned by Bible critic Ferdinand Hitzig, who equated the two. 
doesn't seem like we've found a clear front runner. He can easily satisfy all the points in Daniel, even with him being older, around you know 62 years old. And the scenario satisfies the prophecies of how the Medes would attack the Babylonians as well. So what's the problem with Cyaxares? Or really, what I should say is, who has a problem with Cyaxares? And that person would be Herodotus. Because he said in his famous work in the histories that Astyages had no male heir. So because of Herodotus' comment, and no Persian record attesting to this name, that Cyaxares is and has been drifted away from modern academia and not considered a real historical person. So basically Xenophon was accused of making up a fictional uncle to Cyrus in his narrative. But here's something to note about these two historians. Their versions of Cyrus are very different from one another. Aside from one saying the other had an uncle and the other not, Herodotus said that Cyrus was raised by herdsmen, while Xenophon said that he was raised in the royal house. But a really extreme difference between these views are that Herodotus said that Cyrus revolted against his Median grandfather in 550 BC, and by this he became king of both the Medes and Persians. Xenophon, though, described Cyrus loving his Median grandfather very much, and was even educated by him. This creates a huge contrast because Herodotus said that there was Persian dominance over the Medes from 550 BC on, versus Xenophon portraying an alliance between the two kingdoms. The conclusion of Cyrus's life has Herodotus saying that Cyrus had a very violent death in battle, while Xenophon said that he went peacefully into the grave. Quite a difference, you know, no matter how you cut it. But an important observation here is that Xenophon wrote his work 50 years after Herodotus. So if Herodotus's work was such an instant hit with everyone, why would Xenophon write such a lengthy narrative that is so contrary to his? Because wouldn't everyone have spotted the clear contradictions? Yes, they would have. But maybe it's that Xenophon knew of Herodotus' work and during his military research that he learned of a more complete story about Cyrus. Because even Herodotus said himself that, after this our history proceeds to inquire about Cyrus, who he was that destroyed the empire of Croesus and about the Persians, in what manner they obtained the lead of Asia. Following then the report of some of the Persians, those, men, those I mean, who do not desire to glorify the history of Cyrus, but to speak that which is in fact true. According to the report, I say, I shall write, but I could set forth also the other forms of the story in three other ways. So, how certain can we be that Herodotus got it right saying that Cyrus didn't have a median uncle? The only point I'm trying to make here is that Herodotus could be wrong in saying that Astyages did not have a son, because Herodotus did have some gross errors in his work. Again, I'm not trying to throw Herodotus on the bus here, but simply that we should not elevate him to a mythical level like he's an errant. But here's the beautiful thing for us in this situation. Whether we choose one of them over the other is that both them and all other ancient historians and all archaeological findings refer to someone being called the King of the Medes, after Astyages. And if you look at Barossus' account, he even called that king Darius. So there is sufficient evidence to conclude that somebody other than Cyrus, most likely, held the title of King of the Medes. And the key point to make here with critics on this issue is that they have failed every other time when trying to use this negative evidence approach. We saw it with Belshazzar in our Chapter 5 study, King Sargon used to be objected to until they found the treasure trove at his old capital in Syria, and people used to object to the existence of King David until they found the Tel Dan Stila and the Moabite stone that referred to the House of David. So it's not a matter of if something will be found in reference to Darius the Mean, but when. But the important lesson that came from those examples is that when the extra biblical evidence arose and proved that the personages of the Bible are historically true, that it didn't convert critics into believers, or even at least stop them from using some failed, you know, negative evidence approach. They simply turned their gaze elsewhere in the Bible to attack. So when the day comes that Darius the Mede is confirmed, the likely thing is that they're not going to expect the critics to kneel down, ask for forgiveness, and become a Christian. They will likely say something like, it still doesn't prove that Daniel was written early. Well, that's kind of true, but what it will do is prove that Christians, along with the rest of recorded history, say that the Mede and Persians were merged together at the time of the fall of Babylon in 539 BC. 
Thus, this would make Greece be the third empire in all the prophecies and make Rome the fourth that would then still have Daniel accurately predicting the future even with the critic state in the second century BC. Reminder, hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to visit us at JustScripture.org. In the meantime, stay salty.